Welcome to the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show, a broadcast service of globalbusinessnews.net. Now, here's your host, Ed Cohen. It's January 14, Friday. This is Ed Cohen on globalbusinessnews.net. And the show is uh, Global TV, a talk show, not a webinar and not a free-for-all. But with us, we have experts in um, Latin America, Caribbean, world affairs to some extent. So we're going to go around and introduce uh, now. Uh, first of all, uh, David Edick uh, Jr. is uh, he's based in the San Diego region. Please introduce yourself much better than I just did. Wow. So my background is uh, global political economy, uh, uh, business in Russia, uh, food business, investment banking. Uh, very much focused on energy these days. Uh, and in the world of Latin America, I was involved in a seafood export uh, company for three years developing uh, Mexico's capacity for export. So you have deep experience in, in international business, of course, and the geopolitic emphasis, how it impacts mm, business. Yes, yes. All right, good. We're going to get into that. In line with that, perfectly aligned indeed, there's Ed Rivas. Ed? Please self-intro. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Ed Rivas. I am a senior underwriter, assistant vice president with AxXL, a uh, global uh, insurance company uh, based in Paris. And my specialty for the last 30 years has been international insurance. Uh, generally, what we cover are American, Canadian, European countries uh, with their global um, um, you know, locations and employees. But of course, we do a lot of conglomerates in Latin America. Uh, and my experience includes eight years. I was an expat in Mexico City. So your specialty, we have to get into the details here, is security. Yes, security. Okay. Now that means uh, not necessarily armed fighting, but preventing that from happening or reacting to it in some ways, right? Right, Ed. I think really what it boils down to is, is you know, it's, it's like anything. If you can prevent it from happening is so much the better, right? And I'm not talking just about, say, uh, inventory being stolen at the factory or in transit. Um, it's really more about protecting employees, both uh, any expats or travelers from the U.S. or elsewhere into Latin America, but also the local employees, right? Because I think the idea is, is it's not just to keep operations running profitably, it's to kind of build really a strong reputation and keep everything moving along properly, allow expansion for everyone. Great. Okay. Now you uh, uh, and I uh, go way back. Uh, we've been, mm -hmm. uh, we've produced uh, uh, security uh, conferences uh, having yeah. to do with kidnap and ransom and active shooter and how to save lives, stop the bleed and prepare. Yes. Um, and I'm going to ask you some questions once we get going in the show. Okay. Let's welcome uh, Rob Maisel from New York. Welcome, Rob. Thanks, Ed. Uh, uh, please uh, self intro yourself. We're, we're just doing that right now. Sure. Hey, everybody. Cross cultural trainer and travel coach based out of New York City here. Um, passion for travel, languages, cultures, and excited to learn all about y'all. Yeah, so you have just recently published your first book, and it's about how travel has changed your life and how you recommend it. What's the name of the book? And do you have a, a book you can hold up to the camera here? Oh, you know what? Give me one sec, and yeah, uh, I can. Okay. I mean, don't pass up this <laughs> PR. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll, I'll go grab a copy in just a second. It's called I'll race you to it. <laughs> Actually, yeah, maybe Rob's got a copy. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, so Rob has been on our talk show a few times, and we've talked about travel, and we've talked about the book. Uh, and he, uh, by the way, he and I put on a show, and we interviewed this gal in Tokyo. I think she was Tokyo, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, because you used to live in Tokyo. I did. Yeah, cool. I did. All right. So as you can see, we're uh, a guy's club here. Um, uh, <laughs> we wanted some ladies to come, but I guess they're afraid. Okay. So, uh, let's, let's move on. Rigo, please self intro while Rob finds his book. All right. Yeah. Hey everybody. My name is Rigo. Um, uh, 
from Mexico City. Currently, I work for New Line Chase, uh, but I have been involved in the mobility industry for about 15 years, uh, supporting different areas. Uh, but now New Line Chase is mainly focused on immigration, and I'm happy and passionate to keep supporting the international mobility industry and the international assignees uh, in Latin America mainly. Now, New Land, it's N E W L A N D, and then Chase. Uh, so th this is a law firm, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I know that you guys have people in Canada. You have them in uh, in Santo <laughs> San, Sa Sao Paulo also. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, Mark Nadich, please self-intro. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you uh, recently retired from a Big Pharma, and prior to that, you were with SC Johnson, and uh, why don't you take it from there? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone, afternoon, evening. Um, I spent about 30 plus years in the corporate world in uh, various HR capacities, retired from uh, AbbVie to spin off of Abbott, Worked uh, between those two companies almost 25 years. I spent a number of years at SC Johnson and uh, Ed said I recently retired. It's been a fast four years. I've been retired wow. at least from corporate world. And uh, today I, I, I do three things. I, I am involved in a lot of philanthropic work. I am involved in some consulting, sitting on some boards and uh, enjoying uh, every moment of being a new grandparent. So uh, that's so cool. Uh, okay, Rob, you got a book? Indeed. So let me just. Uh, oh, okay. okay. That one. Oh, look at that. The two, <laughs> the two Robs oh, <laughs> holding it up together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this, this is double barreled PR only on global TV talk show. Okay. So, so Probably this both. is, a, yeah. So, so how, so are people buying this? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely it's definitely been very well received, and I've been very grateful that uh, you know the world has been willing to embrace and and learn from my experiences. And uh, yeah, it's just it's a wonderful and a powerful thing. So, how would you contrast this with what Steve, uh, Steve, whatever his name, Rick Steves has done? So, from what I understand from Rick Steves' work, um, which I haven't studied extensively, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of tips and, and different kinds of things. And I know he delves into, you know, a little bit of meaning behind travel too. I know there's a lot of just different tips and thoughts around travel. Um, I really take it to a deep level where I talk about my experiences mm -hmm. that I had and how they changed me as a person. Um, and the core inspiration behind it too, is I don't want to just be talking about my experiences. I want to use them as a catalyst to show the reader, the viewer, that they in essence can do the same thing. Cool. Uh, Dave, uh, David Edick, uh, I really appreciate you coming on. It's really nice to meet you. We've never met before. Uh, we've exchanged messages as a result of TO's very kind uh, intro. And uh, uh, you have some uh, um, experiences um, that are a worrying. Would, would you get into that a little <laughs> bit? Well, I so I want to get on the same wavelength as everybody else on this call. Is, uh, there's a HR human relations element to pretty much everybody on here. And where I kind of dock in on this space is my involvement with the San Diego uh, Sister Cities program, in particular, San Diego, Vladivostok, Russia. Uh, and I've been very much involved in organizing uh, and executing exchange programs, peer-to-peer uh, -peer professional uh, exchange programs. So uh, mm -hmm. this this international human element that seems to be the common theme here, um, I share in this. Uh, the God worrying stuff. Where do you want to start? You know. <laughs> okay. What about uh, like what's going on in the news today with Putin um, saying he's going to put troops in Nicaragua, Venezuela mm. if we if we do more in Eastern Europe. Uh, this is high-powered negotiation. Uh, the stakes are very, very big. Uh, this is about uh, uh, security stabilization in Europe, uh, most of which since the end of the Cold War and the breakup of the Soviet Union has been uh, on Western terms uh, with the Western vision. Uh, Russia's perspective has never been accounted for uh, particularly and this 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 raising of old 
baggage, if you will, or old flags with Nicaragua and Cuba is negotiating ploy. Right. Okay. So that. I mean, so, can I? Can I? Yeah. Can I um, yeah. Yeah. Please. Here's. I just had a thought, and I'd like um, um, for for the audience that please chime in. I mean, I, I I agree with what you said. I, I almost think you know Putin. Grew, I mean, and and this is separate from the Russian people, right? The, you know, the the normal people, the business people. I mean, they're they're probably just as scared as we are, right? Because it's their sons and daughters. They're going to be on the front lines if something hot goes on, right? So they're not they're they're not they're not loving this either. I think. Um, I, I kind of always, you know, Putin grew up in the KGB in the old state system. He inherited, right, basically a broken country. And and his his aim has always been to basically for his ego. I, I don't know if it's initially his ego or, or but kind of rebuild. Right. And I think if I'm correct, Putin is close to 70 years old if he's not already there. And other than, you know, Crimea, a little bit of eastern Ukraine, I think South Ossetia during, you know, some years ago, he really hasn't expanded Russia's influence or brought back its glory days, you know, and he's kind of on the twilight of his, his, um, of, of, of his, of his life. Right. I mean, now when most people are retiring or, or as you mentioned, you know, like enjoying the grandkids sitting on boards rather than duking it out in the trenches, Mm -hmm. this guy is, is, you know, what am I going to do now? You know, I mean, people are looking at me saying, you promised me the, the 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 return of the Russian bear, and all we're getting is a little cub kind of thing. I mean, any comments from the audience? David? Uh, so one, uh, Russia is different than the Soviet Union. I think that's a, a mm -hmm. crucial thing to uh, carry away here. Um, Putin has been, uh, he defines himself as president, which is essentially czar. Um, oh, yes, sir. <laughs> and there, there, there really was, uh, uh, and this is something the security services people here uh, kind of miss in that what he did come up through security services and then into mm -hmm. St. Saint, Saint Petersburg uh, mayoral office. Uh, but he transformed uh, coming into the presidency. After a couple of years, he got what it was, czar. And re uh, recentralizing, re solidifying uh, Russia. Uh, firstly, uh, Russia was a very chaotic place. Um, I'm not sure. I, really, there's there's no. A Santiago got a whiff of it there a few years ago. Uh, the breakup, the collapse, uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and. Uh, the move, the dropping of communism in favor of, uh, of uh, free market capitalism really was a profound shock on Russia and overturned the society completely. I mean, a true revolution. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's, there's certainly no Americans that have that experience, how shocking that is. And to pull it all, pull things back together, you know, go from being a superpower to uh you know, a basket case. Uh, and I talked with uh, security services, uh, military people in the early 90s, right after uh, a lot of us stock opened up. And they were, they were like, yeah, we're, we're a basket case, you know, and, and we got a lot of problems to solve. And that's our first interest. And we'd like a, a you know, a north, northern hemisphere security zone. What's going on now? Um, I, you raise a good point about his age. Uh, and where Russia is currently economically, financially well positioned to deal with really a, a, a big uh, the settling of the security arrangement between East and West. Now, it's mm -hmm. unfortunate that this is what we've come to, uh, but this is about uh, settling the big issue from the Russian standpoint. Uh, having American military forces uh, or bases in Ukraine, which is where this is headed, uh, is a non-starter for the Russians. And this will get ugly if, if we insist. Okay, so let's talk about the impact on global business, global talent, uh, mobile talent in particular. Rob Pianka, you're a specialist in what I'll call globality, globality. In other words, thinking global. Mm -hmm. Uh, and your background, having lived in uh, the, the Middle East because of your, your dad's position 
in uh, what the Defense Department or the State Department uh, relevant to defense. I I'd like you to uh, bring that perspective forward now. Uh, I, I look at it more from a development and humanitarian assistance point of view. Um, I was in U Yugoslavia in the early 90s and former Soviet Georgia. Uh, with an organization that was associated with Orthodox churches, so also with, with the Russian program. And there was a chance there to end up with something besides a new, a new czar. And we, and it reminds me of, of you know, cultures are our self-contained. We're all sitting on the inside of our bubble talking to each other in a culture. We're looking out a window of occasionally right, at, at other airplanes. It's like you, only the pilot sees out the window. The rest of us are just like sitting in the seats and talking, right? So we sat in the seats, we talked from 1990 to, uh, to now, and it's been a steady progression uh, away from what one what, what would hope would have been uh, uh, a North Star of progress for Russia historically. Um, and if, if things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. If things are going back to the a fragile czar system, they, uh, uh, there's, a whole, there's a whole lot of weakness in that. And weakness, uh, you know, uh, reacts by projecting strength and violence. And, you know, you, you never forget that the only place to defend Moscow is in Germany, geographically, militarily. <laughs> Right there, once once they cross into Russia, it's it's all the way road straight to, to the to the to the life, you know, the, the most important points of Russia, and the Russians have always understood they have to project power, you know, into Europe in order to defend themselves, and that's fine unless you're paranoid, right? You get to a, you get to a point where, you know, the Russian security concerns define that narrowly. Right. And, and I mean narrowly, I mean, in the, from the 1990s on, they, they could have diversified from a resource based economy into something that that, uh, you know, the, the public had a stake in, you know, of, 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 you know, wealth creation on an individual level and, you know, property and things like that. And, they, you know, Putin never really went for that. It's still a, a resource based state where the checkbook is written, you know, was held by one guy and it's a patronage system. And that's pretty dangerous. You know, so I, I'm not, and I don't want to fault, I, I fault everybody instead of anybody, right? But we got ourselves in the situation where we have a very uh, uh, fragile and volatile uh, pretension for world power going down the same damn fault lines that, that, that bled easily 80 million people over two world wars. I mean, my, my, my point of origin as a family is, is around Kiev, but we were Polish. Right. It is it's it's the, the, the bloodlands of Europe. Right. The wars have been fought over this and the big ones that you can't get out of. And we, we just been, you know, dancing along the edge here. And I think right now we're looking into the abyss. It's terribly dangerous. So, you know, if I was world, if I was, you know, international business, if I was the world stock markets, you know, at a certain point in time, it's like you're going to have to realize you might have something that could be the beginning of, a, of, of you know, a, of a, a major military conflict in Europe. And that's not something that, that uh, you take lightly. So oh, a long time ago, um, seemingly a long time ago, but not in this context, uh, the former German leader Gerhard Schrauder uh, was uh, made a deal, which everybody at the time thought it was a good idea uh, to build this pipeline. And now it's completed. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so and now there's a mess because uh, Germany, if not all of Europe, is uh, absolutely in the palm of Putin's hand now. With uh, it, made, it made a lot more sense at that early point in time where the you know, where there was still hope that the post-Soviet circumstance would, you know, go towards the to, to the better, right? And now this the situation, it, it, you know, you could only look at it as a threat. And they haven't finished the pipeline; they haven't opened it up. Right. But that's exactly what I was talking about, the steady degradation over 30 years of what is the major military um, uh, uh, danger on the planet. 
You know, it's always been that, that the Eastern, the, the bloodlands of Eastern Europe, but it's like, it's the Russians looking across at everybody else. And so we should have managed this thing. So Nord Stream is a, is a two-part program. Uh, the deal Gerhard Schroeder signed that mm -hmm. with Gazprom in 2005, mm -hmm. Nord Stream 1 was completed. Uh, it's a two-string pipe, 55 billion cubic meters, and it runs now. Uh, Nord Stream 2 has been completed and pressurized and is awaiting uh, final certification. Um, the gas trade between uh, the Soviet Union and Europe and uh, was something that emerged during the Cold War, uh, starting through Austria, uh, neutral Austria. Um, it's a long story. Uh, the real challenge now for Europe in, in particular, quite frankly, uh, along with Russia, uh, but Russia's kind of in a driver's seat now with, with the gas thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Europe it imports energy on a vast scale. Uh, and Russia has that resource. Uh, they're mm -hmm. on the same page basically as Norway in terms of scale and the Europeans having liberalized and marketized their, their energy economy, natural gas as including. Uh, yeah, LNG is something that they're leaning on in a big way. Uh, and that dependence, if you will, that has turned into big trouble for them this year. Uh, now the U.S. is opposed to, has been opposed to the pipeline projects from the Soviet Union and Western Europe for two generations now. Mm. Uh, we do not have the capacity mm. to bail the Europeans out or supply them with energy should there be a cutoff. Um, no one's interested in doing this, uh, but if it comes to that, things will get really ugly. Uh, and cooler heads will need to prevail, you know, and certainly within the commercial world, those cool heads exist. It's the politicization and what may be weaponization uh, of trade, uh, which gets to the heart of what each one of us does. So let's talk now, um, and I'm going to turn to Ed Rivas. Um, he's a security guy. And... Um, um, in Latin America, and let's talk about Mexico. Uh, so, Ed, uh, in the memo you sent me, uh, I was uh, really thrilled to get that today, frankly, because it summarized everything. So last program we did on this topic, on the idea of Mexico and Latin America, middle-class expansion, was, I mean, there was optimism, but Ed brought up all the issues that nobody wanted to talk about, and that was security issues. So, Ed, now your memo today was more optimistic than it was a month ago. So, yeah. um, what? Okay, uh, tell us about the memo that you sent in detail. Yeah, it, so I think you know, first and foremost, uh, I, I am an optimist by I'm, I'm I'm a realist, but I'm also an optimist by by nature. Um, you know, I think, you know, when we talked earlier on the last couple of weeks, you know, about today's program, you know, I really wanted to focus on from, from my viewpoint, right, the security viewpoint about sustainable growth in Latin America, Mexico. I know it's the kind of the focus today, but I think Latin America in, in, in general, right, in <clears throat> what is working and what can we double down on, right? In other words, in terms of making it work, Um and I think, and, and I would invite anyone to, to, to chime in here, not just on Mexico, but, but Latin America in general. I'll speak of Mexico, because uh, that's probably the country that I have the most. I have, my, my, uh, my mom is, was born down there. I have family down there. I'm very close to them. When I was an expat, I, I saw them almost every weekend. It was almost like a family, uh, an eight-year family reunion. And it still hurts a little bit to be back home in the U.S. because I don't see them every day, you know? Um, I think, you know, a lot of times when you talk about security, and we'll just kind of narrow it down to American and Canadian companies that are putting up facilities in Mexico, right? Be it the, the factories on Piladoras and the industrial parks, the Parque Industriales in Mexico. Um, you know, a lot of times security focuses on things like uh, inventory protection, you know, transportation, because so much of it is done on ground, you know, by tractor trailers up from anywhere from from Mexico City area all the way up north up to the U.S., right, delivering, 
you know, bringing in raw materials in Mexico to convert it to finished goods and bringing it up. And that's important, Ed. But I think today what I wanted to kind of focus on, because talking about sustainable growth and mobility is what happens with the employees of the companies, right? We're not talking about hundreds. We're talking about tens, even hundreds of thousands, really in total, like millions and millions of, of local employees that are working under American and Canadian and other foreign firms, European, Japanese, South Korean, right? That they really do depend on um, their employers, not just for a paycheck, Ed, but quite frankly, for security, for economic growth. You know, I, I remember probably, you know, some of the things that, that I most remember was, um, and, and my experience was borne it out, you know, when you talk about the, the, the labor work, right, in these factories, say putting, you know, vehicles together or, or, or steel mills and so forth, you know, it, it's funny how moms work. And we're all a bunch of guys here, right? We know how, how the wives and the moms work. Um, a lot of times, and, and, and the employers know this, they will give uh, at the factory lunch. It's, it's, you know, you just go to the cafeteria, you pick up your tray, it's free, right? It's included in your, your employment, right? They tend to try, the better employers tend to try and give a little bit heavier of a meal because, you know, if you give the mom one hot dog, she will take it home to her son and she won't eat you know, because she's poor, you know, and, and, but if you give her two hot dogs, she'll eat half a one so she can make it to the end of the day and then take one and a half back. And you think, what does it have to do with security? And I think really that's actually more of a crux of security than anything else, because when you have the community, not just your employees, but their families, the, the local and state politicians, you know, the, the, the church, you know, all these different elements, you know, the, the police, uh, the medical services and so forth, the civil servants, once they all recognize that, you know, you're an employer that cares about not just the employees and the communities, they, they tend to act as your shield. You know, I think another good example is, you know, General Motors uh, near Monterey. It's a little city called Ramos Arispe. You know, they put a factory up there decades ago before Ramos Arispe was kind of a, you know, kind of in the boonies, kind of out there wild. And they basically built not just the factory, but the roads, the power plants, um, you know, the telephone lines, the water supply, and not just for a factory, but a good expansion of the city to house all the workers that were coming into work. It was obviously a small town, you know, it's kind of like the old Detroit or, you know, uh, Lansing and so forth, right? And and Allentown, you know, they go from these small places, they grow huge. And I think companies like General Motors get it. You know, they understand that, okay, sure, we will have security people that will be embedded, both foreign and local in these, in these installations. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the employees and how you protect them. You know, I, I remember in a particular situation that we had, uh, nothing actually happened because we prevented it. And one of the ways that we did it was, was that we convinced the employer to go to the mayor and say, you know, Mayor Cohen, you have to understand, we, we, we understand that there's going to be some theft of our inventory, some shakedowns of our employees, you know, I mean, we can't prevent everything, right? I mean, we are where we are. Um, but by the same token, right now we have a situation and your office and the police force and the state police are really not helping. You know, we kind of knew there was some, some involvement on some level from them in the complicity of what was going on. Um, but basically what we told the mayor was, was that, you know, right now we can nip it at the bud and just let bygones be bygones. Or if this escalates, to where we think it might in the next six to 12 months, we may either need to scale down significantly or even pull out completely of the area. And what's the implication for a politician? They're on their watch, they're the ones that lost thousands of jobs. Good paying permanent jobs were lost on their watch because they couldn't control criminal elements. I mean, we don't need to eliminate the criminal. You can't eliminate the criminal element. It's more to control it to a spot. And I think at that point, you know, the mayor understood, you know, he, he got with the, the police chief, the state commander, the governor, um, and they all realized that, okay, 
something has to be done. We can't let it go wild. We have to kind of contain it and so forth. And, and you know, it included the employees, you know, because a lot of times um, when employees leave the factory, well, they go into their own neighborhoods. They're not protected. So a lot of them were getting shaken down. Some were even being either paid or convinced to be paid to give information on the company, you know, like, you know, get its financials, movements of certain executives in the company or high level management. So being able to get the, the workers protected, the employees and their families in the community really does lend a nice shield of, of defense. And I say that because, you know, we hear so much up here in the U.S. about all the, the narco wars happening in Mexico, right? We hear, and it's true. I mean, there is a lot of money uh, flowing from the U.S. back to Mexico, which is fueling literally every potential criminal to get in on the gig, right? And they're fighting each other. They're fighting the, the, the police, the military. You know, our, our agencies like the DEA and, and, and CIA and ATF are embedded. Um, and, and Mexico is fighting the good fight. It's not a very winnable fight, but they're fighting the fight. So we think, oh, well, we shouldn't invest in Mexico. And I can tell you, Ed, that unless there's, you know, maybe from COVID, there's been a dip. But even with COVID, Ed, I mean, foreign investment in Mexico is rising. And I think it's, yeah. it's correct. I think there's a way with security <clears throat> to make it work. So we were going to have on this program today, uh, 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 we'll just call him a very senior, unnamed executive with a group called USAID. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, they were a little uncomfortable with where this conversation was going to go. So they said, we'll come back and we'll do a show with you, but uh, not this one. And so, so, hey, hey, so everyone, yeah. David, uh, please uh, take it from here. Take me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, we live in San Diego uh, and the, we're part of this binational region of uh, one of the world's leading manufacturing centers. Right. It's very huge. quietly is between San, in San Diego and uh, Northern Baja, you know, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Tijuana, Mexicali. Let me jump in. How come it's not talked about more? Like people, business people like you and me who live here, we know it, but nobody knows it other than us, I think. <laughs> Uh, that's, you know, that, that's that been one of the challenges for regional leadership uh, on both sides of the border. Uh, and as much as we try to erase it, the border insists that it exists. Uh, and people from far away will assure that. It, it's a great story to be told. Uh, yeah. And one of the fascinating things has been the uh, march up market from, you know, this very low skill assembly to increasingly uh, sophisticated operations where yep. components are manufactured yes. in Mexico Big and the labor and the labor that's involved in the factory has talent. Uh, and it's the turnover is becoming a big factor for Mexican operations. They need to retain uh, skilled people at manufacturing. I mean, it's, uh, it's gone beyond this simple assembly uh, quality assembly. Uh, so the, the human element has become very, very important. And it gets to, to what Ed was talking about. And, and how do you uh, create a, not just a sustainable community, but a safe one and one that, that secures, secures the security of everyone involved, including the investor, the company, the manufacturer. Fun times with that, actually, even with the pandemic. Yeah. So uh, Tijuana, uh, which uh, I'm in downtown San Diego in Seaport Village, uh, is like 11 miles, not even. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could, could see it when I go over the Coronado yeah. Bridge. It's right there. I mean, yeah. and, 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 when, and when you go over the bridge, all of a sudden the, the cell network says, welcome to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean. We're living it. Rigo, this all and, relates to bringing people into Mexico as well as Mexican talent being relocated into uh, Panama or Santiago or Buenos Aires, uh, Europe, 
right? Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we have clients and I have seen many companies from, from the border, from Chihuahua, from Juarez. Uh, they, they are certainly, you know, dealing with the U.S. Uh, manufacturing a lot of things. And, and I think currently they, they even not only producing for the U.S., but only sending people to Europe. But, uh, you know, for even for, for training purposes, for learning, for sharing knowledge, and then come back to Mexico and keep, you know, um, certainly producing new things. But yeah, I think um, constantly, uh, I think Edward was saying that uh, companies still insist in investing in Mexico and that, that's good for sure. Um, yeah, I think let's, let's, let's wait for, for the next quarter that hopefully after opening ground things gets better. But... So we have produced in, in the past and hopefully we will again soon, live global HR, management conferences in Mexico City. Uh, one we did with PwC as our host sponsor uh, at the Camino Real in downtown. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, and that, that was good. And then uh, we did a couple with Ernst & Young in Palenco. And, you know, for those of you out there in the audience who aren't familiar with uh, Palenco, it's Beverly Hills. It's that quality. And that's uh, for me, it was my first time, you know, when I went there, so I was like, whoa, <laughs> and it was cool. So Mark Nadich, you have experience with SC Johnson in, in Mexico and Latin America. Would you like to voice something about what we're talking about? Yeah, I, I, I think something that Ed uh, said, I just want to build on a little bit because, you know, the, the whole talent, no matter where you are in the world, there's a talent <laughs> piece to all of this, right? I think David talked about it too, is that how do you attract and retain the, the best talent, no matter what you're making and doing? And I think what you said, Ed, was very powerful around the companies that have a mission and a purpose that is focused on the care and well-being of the people. Uh, those are the companies that are going to continue to have great success and helping to grow their business, right? Um, uh, so I, I, I think that's something that sometimes gets, I don't want to say lost, but, but I think the really good, strong, great companies, I was fortunate to work at fantastic organizations. And I saw every day what Ed was talking about. And it was different in different countries, obviously, based on the circumstances, but it was so important. And I had the Good fortune, not probably as many as countries as Rob has been to, but I, I traveled to more than 50 countries as part of my work. And it, it was incredibly powerful to see how you have to adapt uh, and support the people in your organization with the culture in that particular country or that particular city, that particular community. And, and those that do that well, I think are the ones that are going to continue to, to grow and survive and those that aren't are going to be shutting down some of those businesses. Yeah. David Edick, um, you know, as I said, I live right here in downtown. We go to Ralph's market or Sprouts or Trader Joe's and we get um, these wonderful red and black seedless grapes from Peru. <laughs> they make yeah. them right here in Napa <laughs> Valley or Tem you know, Temecula. How come? Uh, that you know what what's that about uh seasonality is first and foremost i mean it's uh, summertime in uh, south america uh you know price comes in into it uh, yeah i mean the peruvians have developed a uh, using groundwater so this is probably a one generation thing unfortunately uh but uh yeah, uh, and probably Dole is involved in it somehow. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but it's the seasonality that's the driver there. Yeah, so right uh, down the street is the 10th Avenue shipping terminal, yeah. and Dole commands that they bring in their tankers loaded with these containers of who knows what, but like two or three times a week, and then they're offloaded, and then a couple of days later, the ship moseys on out to the pacific and goes south and then they're back again 
I mean, it's huge quantities. No. So what do they go from here? They get on trains. And so guess who owns the trains is Brickshire Hathaway <laughs> and, you know, Burlington Northern. And 24-7, they go right by downtown here, right down the street, banging the noise and everything. But they're loaded to the gills with all this freight. And not only that, just to give you an idea of the economy here in San Diego, downtown anyway, um, the port of L.A. is like 90 miles up the street. And you can't get anything through there because it's all backlogged. And so now San Diego is the closest port that can handle any kind of freight. And so oh, some of that stuff is coming here and then trucked up. Um, and so it's, I mean, the, the economy in Southern California anyway is absolutely red hot and um, it's fueling the real estate price range, of course, <laughs> and, and so many other things. So David Edick, so what do you think about the food business? That energy and food is what you've, you're basically uh, involved with, right? I have a background, uh, for sure. Uh, so San Diego is, is firstly a, a military port. Right. Uh, and big time. Big time. Uh, it, world class. Uh, and LA Long Beach has been a big container port. And San Diego has never been able to contend, to contend with that. We don't have the rail connections, really. I mean, the, there is some, but minimal. No, uh, and, and, and antiquated. And antiquated, uh, kind of a, a U.S. story, quite honest. Um, Dole built a cold storage port here. I mean, it's their primary West Coast uh, import facility for uh, fruit coming out of South America and Central America. Uh, into the U.S. market. They have an East Coast facility as well. So it's, it's about specialization uh, for San Diego, uh, Project Cargo and that reefer port uh, facility import a lot of cars here. Huge car import. Right, from facility. Japan as well. Uh, Japan, Germany, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't do containers here very much, except for those cold store things. Uh, mm. But, you know, food has become very internationalized. Uh, and, and for much of the public, it's, you know, you know, where does food come from? The grocery store, that's where it comes from. But there's a whole story behind it. Uh, and it's, it's loaded with people. We are pleased to welcome Adamo Education as a proud sponsor of Global TV Talk Show. The concept of a micro school is the reimagining of the one room schoolhouse. My name is Tamara Becker. I'm the president and CEO of Adamo Education. The micro school concept really does not just lend itself to the personalization and the customization of learning, but also the social development and fostering that sense of love for learning. Unlike what we see in traditional brick and mortar schools, we have multiple grade levels in the same learning space. Students can be enriched by the socialization that they get, as well as the academic support from peers. What differentiates Adamo is the fact that we are taking the best pieces of brick and mortar, of digital, and then at-home learning. Students here can come five days a week. They can come four hours a day. It will really just depend on what is best for the student and for the parent. To enroll, just reach out via phone, text, or email, and we'll have that personalized conversation, and we'll be able to get you all set. Check us out at adamoeducation.org. Hi, this is Ed, and I thank you for tuning in to Global TV Talk Show, a uh, unit on globalbusinessnews.net. Uh, we uh, broadcast to the world, as you know by now. So I wanted to make sure that you understand that our programs are advertising supported. We're grateful for co-sponsors, advertisers. Um, they have a marketing budget. Coupled with a strong desire to be associated with our top quality program. And of course, I'm grateful. Thank you. So for the next few minutes, you're going to see some uh, commercials. It's uh, mostly very low key. And uh, 
our prices are very, very reasonable. Uh, our exposure for the advertisers go 12 months and beyond. Some of our advertisers have been with us since March, April uh, of 2020. And Google Analytics has tracked uh, over 125,000 what they call audience page views, which means you looking at this page, that's a page view. Now, if you happen to go to one of our other shows or to our radio broadcasts or to our newspaper or magazine, those become additional page views as measured by Google Analytics. And so when they say 125,000 since uh, spring of 2020 up through uh, Labor Day a month ago, that's pretty good numbers. And uh, the past 30 days, Google Analytics has measured uh, just under 6,000 audience page views. Uh, and that, according to them, is a 42% increase in audience participation over the month of August. So thank you very much. Well, here's our advertisers, and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes or so, and we'll proceed with this interesting conversation. Thank you. This episode from the Meeting Room of Global TV Talk Show is brought to you by The Bridge School, the accredited international online private school of choice at bridgek12.org. Porch Light Rental and Destination Services. Reduce your renter lump sum or managed relocation costs. Visit them at porchlightrental.com. And by airs.com. With our full range of services, we can help design and manage your international relocation. Find us at airs.com. Primestone Partners, featuring corporate, government, and developer housing solutions, as well as senior level advisory services. Find them at primestonepartners.com. And by International Auto Source. We are the vehicle experts for expats, featuring all major brands of automobiles with flexible solutions and financing. On the web at intlauto.com. Become a global player in your field. Cross Culture To Go provides virtual support for your global business and career success. We can help you thrive in 140 plus countries and markets. On the web at crossculturetogo.com. Something that's really neat is that the Bridge School partners with various organizations to provide learning for their students. For example, we partner with a major ballet company and we are able to enroll several of their students into our school. So now not only is the student able to participate in a school and have a seamless transition while they're very active in their ballet career, but now they have um, other dancers that are with them that are doing some of the same courses. So it's almost becoming a, a camaraderie where they're taking similar courses, they're working together on their ballet, and really being able to form this great partnership with these organizations to provide a needed service. A lot of times um, there are student athletes who will spend hours and hours at the gym or um, at the, the basketball courts, wherever it is. And if they're attending a traditional school, they're in school from eight to three. They get a quick snack and then they're at the gym for three to four hours in the evening. Coming to us and having that partnership, they're able to break that up throughout the day. They can have a morning practice, get some schooling in, have an afternoon practice, finish their schooling in the evening. So there's that flexibility. And additionally, if there are tournaments or performances, it's fantastic because if there's a week where they have shows straight through, they can take that week off of learning and then pick back up when they're done. So it offers this great flexibility. And for the program owners of these sports leagues, 
it is a win-win situation for them because they see this need. They see this need that their students need to make sure that they are obtaining the grades necessary to be successful adults in, in our country and in other countries. But it provides them an environment where they can be successful at both. Hi, I'm Sergei Gorbatov. I'm Angela Lane. Together we are researchers, writers and practitioners in the field of human resources. And we've also been multi-country, multi-assignment career experts. We owe our professional development and growth to a very large extent to the international assignment opportunities that we have had. But in a world where distributed work may become the norm, we also want to understand what will happen to the nature, duration and purpose of international assignments. Together with our colleague Julian Delzell from the University of South Carolina, we're undertaking a study on the future of expatriation. And we'd value your contribution. You can participate in this important study by completing a simple 10-minute questionnaire. Access the questionnaire by typing in your browser tinyurl.com forward slash expert study. That's tinyurl.com forward slash expert study. You can also find the link here on Ed's website next to this video. Thank you for joining us in this study. In return for your contribution, we'll provide you with a copy of our research. And of course, you'll be invited to an exclusive webinar hosted by Ed, where we will share our findings right here on Global Business News. And so please go to tinyurl.com forward slash expat study. Take the survey so that we can better understand the future of expatriation. So let me uh, j jump in and say that uh, uh, I live uh, uh, at least uh, four minutes away from San Diego Airport, <laughs> it's just down the street. And um, during the pandemic, for uh, wherever they got the money from, they greatly enlarged their freight, <laughs> air freight port, all right, with a brand new facility, giant sized, and it sits right along the runway closer right close to downtown and so you could see what's happening or i see it anyway is that san diego is going to become a major air freight receptacle i think um to uh, pick up the uh the port uh so i'm guessing i don't have any facts or figures but why else would they do that david um well, a lot of cargo flies with people, uh, and that's been one of the challenges for the pandemic has been the, the collapse in passenger traffic uh, led to a, a cut in flights and the cargo capacity that was tied to those passenger flights went away. Uh, one thing that did work were uh, cargo only facilities. Uh, what's happened in San Diego? Well, I'd have to look uh, more closely at it. We're really a, a, a regional game, uh, and uh, I, uh, maybe there's a connection with uh, uh, with Tijuana and the Maquila. Um, I, I'd, I'd have to get closer. I get it. Okay, Ed Rivas. Yeah, I actually had a question for uh, Rigoberto. Um, but but to, to the audience in general, but first to Rigoberto. So um, quick story. So decades ago, when I was in Mexico City, I we ran some telemarketing campaigns, you know, by phone. Do you want to buy an insurance product, a credit card, whatever it might be? Um, and one of the clients I worked with, he was a young man. He was very professional, very creative, like you, Ed. I mean, he he he. he he dreamed up these campaigns and everybody was like, what's he? And we thought he was crazy until he implemented them. And then he, they saw, I mean, he was selling, you know, like, like crazy because his, his mind was so great. I remember some of our, our bosses from New York city came in nothing against New York. I'm more honestly, more against us as Americans. We were having dinner and this gentleman, uh, Ignacio Nacho, 
I remember he mentioned at the dinner, you know, they said like, you know, Nacho, you're doing really great. We like having you as a client because you're so creative. We like your campaigns. What more can we do together? You know, the usual business speak at dinner. And Nacho said something. And, and, and the response from us as Americans, my, my bosses, I did not like. He, Nacho said, I really like telemarketing, mass marketing. And I have, you know, I'm seeing these things work. I would really like to, for myself as a professional one day, not just expand my campaigns into Latin America, but also the US, Canada, and Europe. And our guys were like, you really can't bring something from Mexico or Latin America into the US. They kind of, they kind of like non-verbally shut him down. And he kind of like backtracked a bit and said, well, at least, you know, Latin America. And then the New York guys were like, yeah, yeah, Latin America. Yeah. So what, what, what that tell what, what my thought is, is because I know my employers weren't very good and other employers weren't very good at when they develop, say, talent in Mexico or another country, say Brazil, um, um, you know, Peru, wherever it might be, their first instinct when they're trying to get them promoted to international is to send them somewhere else in Latin America, not the U.S., not Canada, not Europe, Asia. And I think that is a big opportunity lost, not just for the companies and their professionals, but I think for global mobility. You know, I saw some people that even to this day, I would hire them instead of me. And, 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 but there was a bias against bringing someone, and I'm sure Asians probably find it, Africans, Middle Easterns find it that, you know, okay, so if you're really good in Malaysia, I'll send you to Thailand or to Korea or Japan but I'm not going to send you to the U S kind of thing. And I wanted to ask Roberto if he thought that that's still happening, that talent that's developed, say in Mexico, either stays in Mexico or Latin America. It doesn't go further than that. I think, uh, I think that there are a lot of perspectives on, on that regard, but, um, but yeah, I think uh, we, we for sure always take uh, as a first option the U.S. to, to learn, let's say, or, or SaaS and to prepare SaaS uh, and develop our skills. But I think one of the good things about the pandemic currently is that this opened opportunities to engage also, let's say, with other uh, institutions in Europe uh, and then be able, uh, at least I thought from my point of view, that I was able to enroll myself with a Cambridge huge institution for the first time. And, and I did compare even curriculums or how do you say it, syllabus between a US universities and, and then the Europeans ones. And, and I think that that's kind of good that we are opening borders, we are opening uh, mindsets. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of biases for, for living here and Specifically in your business, I would say that when I in my for, with my former employer, we were providing uh, similar services as Rob Maisel, intercultural training. But always the security topic was like the elephant elephant in the room. Yes. <laughs> up, to the, up to the point that we decide to partner with a security company. I, I don't remember the name of the company, but the point is that we were offering interculturally um, uh, sessions, but we were not talking anything about security. For the security part, we have another program that it was uh, performed by, by another company. So we, we, we can basically uh, split that topic and avoid that uncomfortable, yeah, you know, topic in, in the room. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is like it is. And as a Mexican, I have filled with that all my life. I have been involved since the first time that I got pushed on international up, up today, and I still deal with that. I, I still struggle and in avoiding take it personal, but we are, we are what we are, as you said. So, we, it, Rigo, I'll, I'll ask you this in Spanish if you can respond, <laughs> because so it gets across. Rigo, ¿cómo crees que podemos cambiar? Yo me acuerdo que yo digo, yo fui un suscriptor joven cuando estuve en, en la Ciudad de México, y, pero yo sí intenté, y otros uh, compañeros norteamericanos, tratamos de impulsar lo que eran nuestros colegas mexicanos, porque vimos estos cuates, 
uno saben y dos saben a nivel mundial. No tienen que estar eh, como que resguardados en América Latina. Pueden salir de. ¿Qué crees que podamos hacer para que se abren las puertas un poquito? Para que dicen, ¿sabes qué, Rigo? No te vamos a mandar a Brasil ni a Nueva York por dos meses para regresar a México. Te mandamos a mandar a, a la China. ¿Por cuánto tiempo? Cinco años. ¿Cómo ves? What do you think, Rigo? I mean, a answering my question in English to the whole audience. What do you think we can do about this? Because it's, it's really something near and dear to my heart because I have so many friends and, and even some family members that I think that, that really could give global mobility an entirely different facet. Yeah, well, you know what? I think I talk from, from my own perspective. Um, one of the things that really helped me to leverage myself to the next level was basically It sounds like a cliche, but it is like that. I, I truly believe in myself. And that was because I had a Swiss manager who always pushed me to go further and you know, achieve more and more and more and more. And that's something that uh, probably we don't believe at all. Uh, we think we are not capable of, of, but it's like kind of the American dream, just like uh, keep dreaming, keep thinking you can do it and then you will get it. That's like kind of, kind of mindset that we need to... Yeah, we, we need to improve. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear Rob Mizell on this, you know. I mean, you're out of New York, and this is this is your sweet spot, you know. Yeah, well, actually, I just want to I want to talk about what uh, Rigo was saying. Um, the Well, this is such a fascinating conversation, first off. Um, and thank you, Ed, for involving me in it. The mindset piece is really huge. A lot of just stuff that I've learned throughout my experience traveling the world, um, books I've read, people I've spoken to, knowledge I've gained. It really is uh, mindset. We, we, a lot of people downplay the importance of it, um, but having someone else believe in you is huge. Having other people on your team supporting you is helpful, but at the end of the day, you need to believe in you. It's, it sounds cliche, as Rigo said, but, but it has such a powerful impact. And, you know, I think that 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 spans across anything from someone's personal life into their business life. When we talk about relocations and opportunities, as we're looking at, you know, how can we become more global? Like, you know, like like Ed uh, Edward, you were talking about, can we can we look at sending people, you know, maybe not just not just locally, but further globally? Can we send people for longer term assignments and maybe not just the three months? Um, it's so fascinating, and, and when when people believe in themselves could really do amazing things. And it's a matter of then identifying those opportunities and leveraging them, right? And I had this experience as well in, uh, in Mexico with our, with our seafood uh, operations. So we were, we were looking to uh, take Mexican seafood outside the traditional export markets away from North America into Asia and Europe. And one of the steps, key steps to getting into Europe was to get uh, EU certification for your processing plant. And it turns out that that most of the processing, seafood processing plants in Mexico are run by women. They're managed by women uh, wow. because the men are doing the fishing, you know, it's, it's the masculine versus feminine assignments. And the, the a processing plant is about attention to detail. Uh, and women are very good for that. And the challenge that we had was to get to, to lead and to encourage the, these processing plant managers to believe in themselves, that they could do it, that this EU certification, which was a matter of step by step by step, uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't something hairy fuzzy and all, it was uh, very precise. And once they took those steps and each step they achieved, and once they got that certification, wow, you want to talk about people lighting up. Uh, suddenly it was a whole, the they got it they got the world uh they could do it uh and it was tremendous to watch the the surge in self-confidence and, and how that spread in the organization you know uh, it's real mark nadich you're the people person well i just great uh ideas here i, I think one thing i would uh, kind of highlight is organizations that Uh, don't use the word versus are stronger than those that use the word versus and. And so I think the key thing is 
if you have a growth and development mindset as an organization and you build that into your culture and it's, yes, there's going to be situations where you might need to move that person within South America <laughs> to a different country, but their real strength is when you move them to the U.S., when you move them to Canada, when you use, move them to Europe. And I literally had the great opportunity to work with people that lived in 13 different countries on four or five different continents, okay? And talk about the power of diversity and inclusion. And when I became the HR head for Latin America, I didn't know one word of Spanish. Uh, and yet I was still embraced because of the great culture in South America and Central America. And I learned to figure that out, right? I never was good at it, but I learned to do that. And they embraced me because if you try, to your point that you said, Rob, you believe in yourself, then you're gonna have, you're gonna have that great success. But I think the companies that look at growth and development and results versus versus results, I think that's a pretty important thing. Rob Pianker, is that a cultural thing? Well, I'm not exactly sure. I, I think, you know, I'd go back to something that, that Edward said uh, about how the security for the plants were based on community acceptance. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea that we've been talking about uh, conducting business, which requires a certain amount of security. But, you know, I've done, I've been responsible for security and humanitarian aid operations. And the last thing you do is get a gun and, and, and have armed convoys. Right. So there, you know, you have to you have to secure security with smart strategies. And it's, it's vitally important because if you look at the world, you got like eight billion people of them, eight, eight billion people. And the ones above anarchy, instability, migration and, and absolute poverty and the ones below, you know, flying around in jets and, and ruling the world is the vast majority of, of, of the human population and the ones that you know, represent uh, market growth for any company today, not necessarily in, in, in the established developed countries, right? So if you're a company and you, you want to you exploit the opportunity that, that of, of all these people coming up, you know, from, from level one uh, uh, subsistence to level two and level three, if not to level four, that's where the huge market is. And it's, it's multicultural. There isn't any, uh, and it, and, and, I'm sorry to say there's, there's, there's no place to sit where you, where you can get it all. You have, you have to be multicultural to, to take care of that, that business opportunity. And uh, when we first were talking about, you know, the, the Russian situation, you know, you get that kind of stress of, of geopolitical risk laying on top of all the markets and all that type. It just screws the whole thing up for everybody. I mean, you know, I like to focus on everybody getting up in the morning and having breakfast and feeding their kids. And that, that's my idea of, of the human race and the market that we're looking at. And it is by definition, you know, 5,000 human cultures. There isn't any way to avoid the, the, the multicultural nature of the thing that we're talking about. You know? Okay. We're yeah. running out of time, unfortunately, uh, not for our energy, but for the energy of the audience out there. I, I think uh, we ought to keep that in mind. So in the chat thing below, please uh, type in your, emails or your website, LinkedIn, and try to connect with each other for a future time. Uh, that, that would be the ROI uh, for sure. Um, I've really enjoyed producing this program. I had no idea, frankly, how it would go. But you know what? It's because of your energy and your insight uh, and your desire to share. That's what made this program a, a wonderful take. Uh, Rob Maisel, do you think it's transforming for, I think it'll be transforming for others? Oh, yeah. No, and this whole conversation has been uh, very transformative, very informational, I think, for the audience to learn a lot about different facets of, you know, mixed between current events and uh, and just mobility's current state and, and some of the challenges um, and, and transformational, absolutely. Thank, a special thank you to Ed for organizing this. Well, thank you for jumping on the uh, the uh, 
message thing yesterday. Um, so Mark Nadich, uh, at a future time, maybe a month from now, we'll do it again. I invite you to come back. I invite you to uh, bring your special person from Rio and, uh, and also see if you can get KK to free up some time to come back. Sure, he'll be back. He'll be back. He's just in the middle of moving. <laughs> yeah, okay. David Edick, I look forward to meeting you in person somewhere sometime, but I'd like you to come back. Um, we'll try to do it uh, once a month. Uh, and uh, Tio, I'm sure we'll come back. Rigo, thank you very much for circulating the PR to your extensive network. And when we get this uh, show uh, edited and ready for on demand, you'll all get a copy, of course, free. Uh, and please circulate it to your own networks. That way, we could literally reach uh, well over 100,000 audience across the next month or two uh, with an upside. Who knows? You know, Because of our LinkedIn connections and all that, it could reach a million across the world. Ed Rivas, I really appreciate you speaking in Spanish. Um, I think we ought to have a segment in every show with people speak their uh, other language. What do you think, David Edick? Is that diplomatic enough? <laughs> uh, it, it might fragment your audience a bit, but uh, <laughs> that, that's, uh. yeah, right, right. Okay, well, let's uh, sign off. Have a nice weekend, Great. and um, please come back on Global TV. This is Ed in San Diego, David Edick, uh, east of San Diego, um, Rigo in Mexico City, Ed Rivas in Dallas, Mark Nadich. In, in, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Rob Maisel in downtown New York City, um, in, um, what's that area called, where all the red brick buildings are? Stuyvesant, right? Stuyvesant Town, yep. Yeah, that's great. Rob Pianka. So, Rob, one last thing. Um, spring is far away in the Amish country. I know they're very agricultural in your area there. Uh, having been there a couple of times, visiting some family in York. Uh, so what's going on this weekend in, in Lancaster? Uh, is, is there something special? Oh, I think we've lost. You might have lost him. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah, that was a good idea. Frozen, he'd, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all and take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show. Have a wonderful day and stay safe.